Okay, wonderful. So welcome to draft seven of the budget. This will be known as the proposed final budget for 2023. Next slide, Mr. Stengel. Um, so as the board knows and the community knows, and I talk a lot about during my uh, budget strategy uh, kind of sessions in the spring, that there are essentially three ways to balance our budgets, both an increase of revenue, a reduction of expenditures, and a use of fund balance, or a mix of all three. So some school districts maybe use one or only two of these strategies. Historically, we have used a mix of all three of these to balance our budget, and we definitely used all the tools in our toolbox this year to balance the budget using all these appropriate measures. Mr. Stengel, next slide, please. So since we last met in March, we've had some significant changes uh, from the last draft, draft four to draft seven, and these categories were updated accordingly. Uh, based on a five-year look-back period, projections with the closing of March, and um, a, a navigation of about $800,000 in mandated cost uh, for our most exceptional students. So uh, the list in summary, um, not replacing seven PCAs, not replacing a custodial retirement, uh, reduction in overtime based on a five-year average, um, elimination of the primary expressions classroom, uh, a reduction of district travel by 10%, a reduction in, in our supply budgets by 10%, uh, re reduced tuition reimbursement both to teachers and administrators uh, based on historical costs and, and knowing who is continuing on with their education, a uh, reduction in professional services uh, across many departments. Um, and we got an updated, we got an updated workers comp quote uh, that was significantly under um, our budget for this year, and we've negotiated with our insurance carriers to bring some of those prices down. So on the revenue side, um, it, on these sides, you'll see a lot of increases and updates. Um, a, a recommended tax increase we will discuss further tonight of 0 0.80 mills, an increase in earned income tax budget uh, based on this year's collections, which are coming in very nicely, uh, an increase from last draft in our realty transfer tax and delinquent taxes, uh, in, Increase in IDEA pass-through funds from the AIU uh, based on a historical average. We did get some extra money this year through ESSER, but that will be set back to uh, previous year limits. Um, and the governor has updated his basic ed subsidies uh, for this school year, and um, we're, we're taking a 1% increase, so we're not taking the, the, the budget that's currently on the table by the state. So we're guarding against that. Uh, some updates in transportation subsidy, our health subsidy, and then anytime you um, update salaries, uh, the PEASERS and Social Security subsidies are a calculation against salary. So those changed, and we updated the Title I and medical access federal funds based on historical averages and some news we were hearing about next school year. Thank you. Mr. Glucko, can we stay on this slide for a minute? Sure. I, I, I have a couple That's of a questions. <laughs> yeah, I think there's some bigger. this one would, would, would raise the questions, yes. So I'll, I'll open up the floor first, and if, uh, if there's any that... Okay. I, ha time. I have a couple of questions, um, starting with the uh, not replacing five, uh, sorry, seven PCAs. Um, I, I know that we've struggled to get and retain PCAs, but aren't those um, required uh, per a child's individual education plan. Um, so if we're not replacing seven PCAs, are we meeting the needs of those children um, is, is the first big question. And then I have some other Certainly. questions. Certainly. So we, uh, Dr. Steiner and I met extensively with Dr. Doyle and uh, her staffing in need in that department. And like you said, it's been a struggle to find those folks in those support roles. And we've been operating effectively this school year um, with a reduced amount. So we will continue that going forward. Uh, we are making sure that we do uh, meet the needs of every child. Um, we are going to be a little bit more involved in discussing whether those services can be provided by somebody else. Um, but staffing is the place where we have to be the most cautious. And Dr. Doyle, do you want to say anything else about staffing for PCAs? The microphone. Well, uh, our personal care assistants, they certainly are important in terms of providing the services, providing services for our students with disabilities. 
It's also important that we invest in professional development for our general education teachers, as well as other professionals and educators that work with our students to make sure that needs are met in the general education classroom and across the school environment. So those are also, because one of the, one of the issues that's been discussed, not only by our district, but across the state and really across the country is with uh, just the change the way that our world has changed and just the changing of the change in the population we have less people out there that are that are filling those roles as personal care assistants not just in mount lebanon but also you know across the state and one of the conversations we had um all of the directors had with the allegheny intermediate unit was ways that districts and the AIU because they provide a lot of services for students with disabilities and require a lot of PCAs. How can we better serve students with teachers by prepare, by equipping teachers with the skills and the professional development they need to meet the, the needs of students with disabilities, which really just promotes, it promotes more inclusion and, um, and more independence with students. And of course, if a student really definitely does need a personal care assistant, we will provide that individual for those students or that student. Yeah, and as you remember, Ms. Albrecht, we had 67 mm -hmm. um, personal care assistants, so we have looked at it and we believe that we'll be able to operate effectively uh, with seven less. Oh, yeah. I mean, part of the reason why I asked is last month when we had an update from Dr. Davis and Dr. Irvin, they mentioned that there is an increase in some of our behavioral issues, which I know, you know our PCAs are, are really quite involved in, in helping us um, keep those children in the classroom learning and on task. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you know, we're doing everything and making sure all of the kids' needs are being met. Um, Can I, I have a question about that line item as well, which is um, just kind of ensuring that in the final budget that we have uh, that we maintain the flexibility for the administration to uh, increase that number if the need is there for a child as well. Mm -hmm. if, real quick before we move on, Mrs. Albrecht, on, on that uh, PCA question, uh, Dr. Doyle, um, am, am I correct in this, uh, Dr. Doyle or Dr. Steinhauer, that our, our most recent staffing numbers uh, regarding PCAs was driven largely by our, our push towards the ABA model. Um, when, when I, I know Dr. Doyle, this predates you a little bit. Um, do, you, do you remember, Dr. Steinhauer, is, yeah. that, is that accurate? Uh, it's not the full number, right? Uh, but it's certainly uh, the, our ABA classrooms. Now we have two at the elementary, one at the middle school, and next year we'll be adding one to the high school. They are labor intensive uh, with the children, and so they do require additional adults in the room. But our current analysis right now is that we are able to effectively staff with 60 uh, PCAs yep. right now. If something would come up, Ms. Flusher, we certainly have some flexibility uh, in that area. And my question is that maybe this is a conversation for, for another meeting down the road, because I know that you guys are going through an analysis right now regarding sort of our approach to special education across the district. And, and I'm, I'm heartened to hear Dr. Doyle, you know, in your, in your description tonight, uh, a discussion of inclusion, a discussion of, you know, maintaining uh, our students in the general education, you know, least, least restrictive environment. Um, you know, d does does this staffing transition um, is it indicative of a of, of philosophical shift, um, or we don't know yet, or or just that's how the num the numbers fall. Well, uh, the shift in P or the the staffing of PCAs that's really not tied to any philosophical shift. I will tell you that as a as a district, we are really, and a passion of mine is inclusion for, for children with disabilities in the regular education environment. I think that's very important. That's where students do, that's where they learn the most. That's where they do their best learning and they, they're with, when they're with their same age peers. So that's something that is a focus of the district but is not necessarily tied to the personal care assistant numbers. And also with our, um, with our ABA classrooms, we now have three at the elementary, one at the middle school, and, and one at the middle school. And then I was almost going to say one at the high school, but the one at the high school will be starting in the 2022, 2023, 2023 school year. 
Thank you. A risk that this would, I mean, there's like a lot of educational trauma still out there for teachers. Is there, is there a risk that this would be placing too much of a burden on teachers by not having the supportive staff? Well, I, I don't believe so because in all um, in all honesty we've had probably we've had probably between 10 and 12 openings of pca positions all year now we're finally getting to a place where we have people that are more where we're filling some of those positions but still we have we have a lot of openings and that's not something that is um that that is unique to mount lebanon that's something that you that you'll see especially in places where there's a lot, where there's a need for a lot of PCAs. So two questions on my end. Number one, I'm making the assumption that by we're saying not replace, we're just not backfilling the existing openings. Correct. Okay, and second, uh, when it comes to PCAs, we're saying we're not gonna replace seven, under what conditions would we ultimately need an increase? That would be driven by student IEPs. So if we have new students move into the district or we discover um, significant needs of children, um, we would be adding those back in, but it's all IEP driven. Certainly. Uh, is there a threshold or a percentage that we can say, you know, this number of IEPs will equate to us actually saying we need to add back PCAs? It's really individual student one -one. based mm -hmm. rather than uh, the number of kids that, so it's really individual student based. Correct. Sometimes they do um, service several students in the classroom. Um, that's probably the most efficient model, but you know, Dr. Doyle mentioned about uh, equipping our teachers with the capacity to uh, address the needs of kids. And we really do have an inclusion model where we think kids being in classrooms with other students is the best situation for them. Other questions on expenditures and revenues? Yes. Oh, we move on to the slide, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Albrecht. Yes, so I have a few other questions. Um, Right under that, we have you know, the not replacing custodial retirements, and then below that, um, reduced overtime. Now, I know our overtime typically is our hourly employees, which our custodians are the ones who mainly fall under that. Um, if we're decreasing our number of custodians due to retirement, how are we then also going to reduce overtime? Uh, Ms. Albrecht, we looked back at a five-year average, and we've been significantly underspending that category for the last five years, so we feel comfortable turning that down, even with the increase in overtime this year. And even if we, uh, you know, as we have had several custodian, full-time custodial positions gone unfilled, and that's what precipitated uh, some of the overtime. Um, so we believe with filling the ones that are open uh, will help us have less overtime, but also maintain the, our, our schools. You know, we, we do ask um, our uh, Mr. Marseniak and his team to uh, look for any efficiencies possible. Um, as we've talked many times, uh, the savings are in people. Um, and when we have the opportunity to, to, to um, recoup a savings, and that, that's what we have to do. Good. Other questions on expenditures, revenues on the slide? Uh, Mr. Galecko, regarding refined health care costs, I know the number that came in this year was was a pretty big one. So what what, what did you mean by refined? So uh, th that's a continued moving target with health care um, based on what, whether people take an individual benefit, which is around $6,000 a year, or a family benefit that is around $22,000 a year. So normally when, when folks retire, we plan for them to, our, our replacement to have family benefits. We've had a significant savings in that this year. Our healthcare number is trending about a half a million dollars under. The initial increase was about 8%. It came in around four and a half, refining those costs and tying those benefits to the people that are retired. On the category of expenditures, it seems what, what you've depicted um, pretty uniformly would result in, in uh, you know, a net savings. Um, but there were some other things that came out recently that were increases. Um, I think transportation was one, and there was another special education number also. Could you speak to those? Certainly. Uh, so a, a couple more outside placements of our uh, students with special needs for next year. Um, between their outside placement tuition and their transportation, it increased those categories by just under $800,000. So reducing in these other categories allow us to absorb those expenditures. Other questions from the board? Okay, 
Next slide. So after all those changes are done, our administrative recommendation for the proposed final budget this evening will be a tax increase of 0 .80 mills, uh, which is a use of $750,000 in fund balance. And it, this will allow us to staff the district and meet all the goals in the strategic plan, maintains all of our, cur our current programming, and again, like we discussed, allows for uh, very little flexibility, but to address those PCAs should those come up. Um, this maintains the programmatic integrity of the Mount Lebanon School District. Um, we make our budgets very close. We are in with about 1% of our budget in, at $109 million next year almost. 1% is about a million dollars. So there's not uh, much wiggle room, but we believe that this is an uh, accurate spending plan and we will able to be able to meet the educational needs of our students and staff uh, with this budget. So we can go to the next slide, Mr. Stengel. Go ahead. Th this, these all kind of relate. So. That's correct. So we're not going to know that for certain prior to passing this budget. So there's no way that even if we get an increase um, somewhere in between where we've been and where the current projection is, we're not going to be able to sort of refine the, the numbers based on that. Yeah, I, I don't foresee us seeing a state budget before June 30th. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. Um, and then anything we get in addition in, in, in education subsidy from the state will essentially be a will windfall to make up that use of fund balance number that we're talking about. So we're very hopeful for it. I initially uh, had some negative thoughts about that budget and its ability to pass, but we're hearing some better news through the legislature. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. So that was, I mean, I, and I guess the other question is what if anything might change in this recommendation? So as we continue to go on, and, and I'll discuss this a little further on, but you know, we, we still have a one month to look at this budget. So it will go on public display uh, after the proposed final budget is approved, hopefully next Tuesday evening. Um, so we will have this month to make any reductions or increases in revenue that we see necessary uh, with closing of April or any news we hear from Harrisburg. So we still have a, a, a amount of flexibility between now and May, but um, it's, as, as it stands, in total, it won't be a huge material difference, but we're, we're very close. So uh, as I discussed on the previous slide, uh, the draft seven recommendation with a 0 0.80 mil increase, uh, setting revenues at 107.7 million, expenditures at 108.4 million, a use of ba uh, fund balance of 750,000. Um, this board since uh, April of 2020, the discussion has been with a zero mil budget each year is to uh, use less reliance on fund balance to balance our budget. I'll continue on in some additional slides about how we're doing that in, in meeting those, uh, those goals. Um, but the index this year was 0.87 mils. So this does not go completely to the index. Again, like I talked about the strategies of using fund balance, expenditure reductions, revenue increases, a mixture of all three of those things to balance the budget. Um, and then this, again, reduces our use of fund balance from 1.5 million in the year we're currently in to 750 next year. 750 was the comfortability of this board uh, previous to 2018-19 that was typically used. So that 0 .80 uh, increase, uh, most, most folks won't know how that kind of shakes out, but it, it, the average median household value in Mount Lebanon is $300,000, so that equates to about $240 a year or $20 a month. Mr. Gluck, on the uh, expenditures, how, what are, how are we trending this year as far as this current forecast on expenditures? Certainly, uh, our current expenditures are trending nicely. We had two uh, expenditures that were unplanned for. Uh, one was a, a shift, uh, our, it was planned for in our reserve piece of our fund balance. We had 850,000 transferred to capital reserve to uh, address our capital reserve list. And then we got another uh, technology grant where we had to expend about $800,000 before the federal grant reimbursements. Besides those two categories, which we'll look over spent, uh, we're, we're trending under in all categories, specifically salaries and benefits, about 600,000 under budget. So this represents the 108 million, um, what percent roughly increase year over year of expenditures? Um, this is um, 
really it's it's hard to do that with the year that we're in uh, because we have 2.4 million dollars in ESSER expenditures in this school year. I would say two percent. Okay. And uh, same with the revenue. Uh, we only went up in revenue about a million dollars, so like a one percent increase in total revenue and maybe a two percent increase in expenditures. So it sounds like the expenditures are relatively flat. Certainly. Well, uh, with, with our changes to staffing um, and those reductions I discussed on, on the second slide there, uh, that's how we were able to achieve that. All right, we can flip to the next slide, Mr. Stangle. So again, uh, this has been a, the board's goal since May of 2020 when we started recovery talks um, about the, the, to reduce the reliance of fund balance to balance the budget. You can see here the history of budgeted fund balance usage over the last uh, few years. So in the 1819, uh, 750,000 was used to balance the budget, a million in 1920. Uh, the zero mil year 2021 was 2.7 million, 21, 22, 1.5, and then our recommendation tonight is the 750,000 to do that. So you can see that the history, how we've kind of uh, absorbed those uh, outlier years and we're working our way back towards structural balance. With, with uh, the administrative recommendation and where we're projected um, to end in June, like where would that leave our unassigned fund balance roughly? So currently, um, we're trending about a million dollars to the good in this school year. So uh, we would only use 500,000 of the planned 1.5 million. So that's currently where our projections stand today. Obviously, we still have uh, two and a half months to close out the school year. I don't expect any uh, thing to come up, but I said that in March of 2020 before <laughs> that sort of happened too. So we'll continue to watch those. Um, close April, uh, we get a new ex assessment disc in May, which I don't expect to change very much, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep a watchful eye on those things. I mean, part of the reason I ask that is because I know that the public, the budget that's on display to the public doesn't necessarily reflect where we are because we have to use our budget from last year instead of our actuals. Yeah, so Ms. Year. Fleischer, when she got the, the budget um, from the on the state form, which is the way we're required to post it, um, the, the state fills in the categories of yeah. fund balance and usage this year, so it would look like we wouldn't meet our threshold okay. at year end. Right now, um, I would say our fund balance at year end would be just shy of $8 million, which we're about 8.4 right now, so. And, and the, the, the policy required minimum of 6%. I mean, we're there now. We're, we're there now. Uh, the way this year is trending, we would stay there and still have money to be able to be appropriated to post employment benefits and capital projects should we need them. Okay. And, and, and moving forward to next year, that uh, percentage of unassigned fund balance, what, what, what does that look like? Based so 6% uh, so of next year's budget. Oh, let me get in my... Is it, is it 6 for next year or is it... So it is six. Um, we, we took board action. Uh, the board took action for the 2021 year to be at 5%. Mm -hmm. um, should the board want to address that in the future and allocate additional monies to capital projects, we would have to do a separate resolution for that. Um, but like I said, the next year's spending plan at uh, $108.4 million, 6% threshold would be uh, $6.5 million. Uh, with our current estimates, we would have $1.4 million for appropriation. Uh, to other capital projects and or post-employment benefits. All right, we can go to the next slide, Mr. Stengel. So uh, I turn what we discussed graphically and then with our projections going forward. So in 2020-21, uh, you can see the 2.75 million, which was the zero mil budget year, the 21-22, which is the fiscal year we're currently in. My initial projections in the spring of 2020 called for a million dollar use of fund balance this year uh, with some bit of tax increase. And, and as you can see, our recommendation is $250,000 lower from that. And then um, as um, we go on and, and some of our uh, expenditures haven't been increasing as much as we thought and uh, revenues have returned to somewhat normalcy, um, you can see that um, the reduction in use of fund balance to balance the budget over the next three years has gone down about $250,000 per year. So beyond 22, 23 projections are looking better um, based on uh, figures we're seeing as revenues. Hopefully the state budget comes through and um, uh, things are, are looking better as we continue to project. It didn't look so great last spring, but things changed pretty rapidly. 
So just to provide some, some context, and I know that we've discussed this before, but I, I don't know if everybody in the room has, has been privy to all of the budget conversations. I hope not. Um, <laughs> In 2020, 2021, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the board, as it was constituted at that time, made a decision to um, cut the community a financial break and pass a zero mill budget. So it meant no tax increase in that year. And financially, to assist in that, um, the fund balance was, was utilized as it's depicted on, on that top bar graph. Correct. And coming out of that year, you, uh, again, at the board's direction, put together a five-year plan for how to recover from that, from, from, from no tax increase. Because a, a tax increase, you know, it's not a one-time, um, you know, uh, addition to, to revenue. It's, it's a, it's a year-upon-year uh, compounding revenue stream. And when you forego that, you forego that this year, next year, and, and every year beyond. Um, so to to adjust for that uh, required some you know long and, and medium term planning um, to get us back to um, you know a, a balanced budget. Correct. So that that's been the the board's goal all around since the May of 2020 to, is to return to structural balance. Um, additionally, in the spring of 2020, um, as far as the the fund balance uses that that we projected back then. Um, we were calling for 1.7 mils of increase over the subsequent two years. So in 2122 and 2223, uh, if you added those, add those two years together, would have been about 1.7 mils. Um, we're coming in with 1.6 mils. So we're just barely a hair under our, our projections, both in the millage increases and the use of fund balance, but it came very close. And then this chart, the, the green line depicts what your five-year snapshot forecast was at that time back in 2021. Correct. Um, but then the yellow line below it now depicts where we are currently. Currently. In, in the current forecast within that same five-year window. Correct. With with this budget and uh, projecting five years out, that's what it looks like going forward. You are correct. Thank you. Yep. Next slide, Mr. Stengel. So uh, continued refinement, like I mentioned uh, early in the presentation, uh, staffing is our driver here, 80% going to salaries and benefits. You know, we'll watch out for new retirements or, or uh, any way we can adjust staffing to help the budget. Uh, we'll continue to watch our, our revenues. We'll close April and, and project off of our April closing. Again, uh, same thing in, in the expenditure category. Um, we're hearing positive news from Harrisburg at this time. But our federal funds have returned to pre-pandemic, pre-ESSER levels. Uh, so we're very comfortable where they're at. And I do not foresee any more uh, increases in that category. So we can go to the last slide, Mr. Stengel. So where to find all this budget information and presentations? Um, this is about the fourth or fifth budget presentation we've done this spring. But our MTLSD website, uh, About Us Budget, you'll see all the linked presentations, all the linked um, uh, PowerPoints, all the linked uh, documents that you would need to decipher the budget. Uh, there'll be a budget summary there, our PDE 2028, which is the official state form that has to be available for public inspection. So on April 19th, we'll be asking the board to approve the preliminary budget motion, knowing that the community will have the opportunity to provide comment. And we will, again, continue to look for refinements for that last month of the budget. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Mr. Galeco? Can, can, I, can I ask a question? Please, Dr. Hackett, yes. Uh, Mr. Galeco, la last year you gave us a pro uh, projected <laughs> millage increase over the next few years. Uh, and I didn't see that in this presentation. Do you have that information? Uh, Dr. Hackett, so the, I will tell you that the increases in the index uh, for the next two years are 4.3% and 4.3%. I, I know the board wouldn't want to commit to a... a um, tax increase of that magnitude. So um, that, that would be the initial starting point when we started next budget season. Um, I, I would expect us uh, hopefully to be around the same level we are this year with the tax increase there. But until we know, again, staffing next year, state revenue and everything, um, you know, it, it will be part of our strategy to balance these budgets with minimal tax increases, reduction in expenditures in the appropriate areas and the appropriate use of fund balance to operate our programs how they are. So when, when you say being in the same spot next year, does that say you anticipate another 0.8 mil next year? Um, 
Yeah, I, I would. I wouldn't want to commit to that now, Dr. Hackett, without seeing those numbers. But um, it, the strategy of this uh, school board over the last 30 years has been um, by about a point five mil increase historically year after year. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Mr. Glecko. Thank you.